The Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic will come to order. I want to welcome everyone this morning. <coughs> Prior to the pandemic, NIAID awarded at least three grants via the New York Blood Center to Dr. Zhao Yusin. Are you aware of these? I'm sorry, to Dr. Yusin Zhao. Are you aware of those grants? Dr. Yusin Zhao. Your microphone is not on, doctor. Your microphone is not on. I'm not familiar with that name. Okay. Well, NIAID awarded at least three grants via the New York Blood Center to that, that, that scientist. He was a high-ranking Chinese PLA official and director of a lab at the Chinese Academy of Military Medical Sciences. Does it concern you if U.S. taxpayer dollars are funding someone like this? Grants that are submitted to the NIAID go through a very Does it concern you? I, I'm not talking about the process well, I, right I don't now. know Does anything it concern you that, the U, that U.S. taxpayer dollars would be going to someone who's a high-ranking Chinese PLA official? Yes or no? I would have to know more about that, Mr. Chairman, okay. because I don't even well, know the person me. you're talking about. Are you or were you ever aware that the U.S. State Department in 2005 issued warnings that the Chinese government was working on the creation of bioweapons? I was not aware of that. Thank you. Did you ever discuss the Chinese bioweapons program with anyone in the intelligence community? I've never discussed the Chinese bioweapons program, to my knowledge, with anybody. Before, during, or after the COVID-19 pandemic, did you speak to the FBI, CIA, DIA, or any U.S. intelligence agency concerning viral research of any kind? What, what time frame are you talking about, sir? Be I said before, during, or after the COVID-19 pandemic, did you speak to the FBI, CIA, DIA, or any U.S. intelligence agency concerning viral research of any kind? I can't give you the specifics of it, but back in the time of the anthrax attacks, we certainly had a number of briefings of, um, by agencies that, that were intelligence agencies. I don't remember who they were. It could have been any of the above that you mentioned about the possibility that there were bioweapons that had fallen into the hands of bad actors, i.e. terrorists, that might have been used potentially as a bioterror attack. That was at a time when we had thought so, yes. that the anthrax so I appreciate I appreciate that. I appreciate your expertise in that. Well, that's but, the answer. But, but did you at any time talk to concerning viral research of any kind? Again, I say that at the time that there was concern about the fact that Al-Qaeda may have been using or potentially using bioweapons, we had discussions with intelligence agencies about that sure, possibility. but not as related to, say, COVID-19? Not to my knowledge okay. about COVID-19. But let me just make sure we get the facts. After the um, investigations began about COVID, I was briefed by uh, intelligence agencies about possibilities of there being uh, activities going on in different laboratories. I was briefed by intelligence agencies. Okay, thank you. Science is always open to debate, and it's a benefit. The science supported restricting travel from certain countries at the beginning of the pandemic. And after these orders went into effect, the president was called racist and xenophobic. Dr. Fauci, you said in your transcribed interview that you um, supported those orders. Dr. Fauci, were those orders racist and xenophobic? No, they were not. Thank you. The vaccine saved millions of lives, and I want to thank you for your support and engagement on that. However, despite statements to the contrary, I, it did not stop transmission of the virus. Did the COVID vaccine stop transmission of the virus? That is a complicated issue because in the beginning, the first iteration of the vaccines did have an effect, not 100%, not a high effect. They did 
uh, prevent infection and, and, and subsequently, obviously, transmission. However, it's important to point out something that we did not know early on that became evident as the months went by is that the durability of protection against infection and hence transmission was relatively limited, whereas the duration of protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and deaths was more prolonged. We did not know that in the beginning. In the beginning, it was felt that, in fact, it did prevent infection and thus transmission. But that was proven, as time went by, to not be a durable effect. Yeah, it definitely had positive effect for many people, especially those that were vulnerable. But we knew from the trials that people that got vaccinated still were subject to getting COVID. So was the COVID vaccine 100% effective? I don't believe any vaccine is 100% effective. I now recognize the ranking member, Dr. Reeves from California for five minutes of questions. Thank you. Um, over the past year and a half, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have relentlessly vilified Dr. Fauci under the guise of investigating the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. But after reviewing nearly half a million pages of documents, conducting 20 closed door interviews and receiving testimony from nearly a dozen witnesses brought before this select subcommittee for public hearings, they have come up empty handed for evidence of their extreme allegations that Dr. Fauci lied about gain of function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and caused the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to address both of the Republican claims in turn. Throughout the majority's investigation, the Select Subcommittee has heard three definitions for gain of function research. Of the three, Republicans have relied heavily on an overly broad definition that has no regulatory significance. Let me repeat that, no regulatory significance. In fact, their definition is so broad that it would include the manufacture of flu vaccines as gain of function. Because it is so broad, the National Institute of Health does not use that definition when assessing whether proposed research is or is not, quote unquote, gain of function research. For those assessments, NIH has instead appropriately used the definitions provided in regulations. And to be clear, the select subcommittee has been reminded by witnesses after witness that NIH at all times referred to regulations for the definition of gain-of-function research and not to a nebulous, expansive definition with no legal bearing that is so broad it could apply to, again, the manufacturing of flu vaccines. Dr. Fauci, according to the regulatory definitions, for example, in P3CO, that NIH applied to proposed research, did NIH ever fund gain-of-function research in Wuhan, China? Uh, as you said, uh, 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 Congressman Ruiz, according to the regulatory and operative definition of P3CO, the NIH did not fund gain-of-function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Thank you. And despite my Republican colleagues' effort to fit a square peg into a round hole, it seems to me that you've been consistent on this issue from the beginning of the pandemic. And they know this, but they still use the terms gain of function loosely. And with respect to NIAID staff's assessments of whether proposed research was or was not gain of function research, were you personally involved in those assessments? or were those assessments made several levels removed from you and by subject matter experts? Those assessments were done by highly qualified and experienced program people several levels below me. Thank you. And your public statements that NIH did not fund gain of function research in Wuhan reflected the assessments made by NIAID subject matter experts applying a definition found in the regulation known as the P3CO framework, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you, and thank you for clarifying that. In fact, all of that is abundantly clear in your 2021 Senate testimony on this matter. When asked by the Senate about gain-of-function research, you testified, quote, that is why we have committees. We have a P3CO committee. You also testified in 2021, quote, gain-of-function is a very nebulous term. 
we have spent, not us, but outside bodies, a considerable amount of effort to give a more precise definition to the type of research that is of concern that might lead to a dangerous situation. You are aware of that. That is called P3CO. That was back in 2021. At the time of your May 2021 testimony, P3CO had been the operative definition of gain-of-function research for several years, correct? That is correct. So I will note that at your transcribed interview in January, the majority conceded that NIH did not fund research in Wuhan that met the criteria of P3CO. I encourage the audience to read the transcript of that interview so you can evaluate the merit of the majority's claims for yourselves. So now if we could quickly turn to the irresponsible and false accusation that you created, SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. So this accusation centers on a grant NIAID awarded to Echo Health Alliance with a subaward to the Wuhan Institute of Vi Virology. And we have been entertained earlier about the suggestion that this funding could have possibly gone to a bioweapons research capacity as well. So I want to be clear, no evidence provided to the select subcommittee demonstrates that the work performed under NIH funding, including at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, led to the creation of SARS-CoV-2. The majority has failed to demonstrate or even credibly suggest that any of the viruses studied under the grant could even possibly have been the progenitor virus. Dr. Fauci, could you briefly explain why none of the viruses studied under the Echo Health Alliance grant could have been the progenitor virus of the SARS-CoV-2? When you're talking about the evolution of a virus from one to another, the viruses that were studied under the sub-award to the Wuhan Institute that have been reported in progress reports in the literature and published papers, those viruses were phylogenetically so far removed from, so, from, from uh, SARS-CoV-2 that it is molecularly impossible for those viruses to have evolved or being made into SARS-CoV-2. It's just a virological fact. They were so far removed that it could not possibly be a progenitor of SARS-CoV-2. So I want to be very clear on this point that the funding and the research conducted by Echo Health uh, did not produce SARS-CoV-2. That doesn't negate that this lab could have, another lab could have been doing research and it could have leaked from a lab. It still is a possibility, but it was not directly or it was not funded by NIAD or NIH. And just for the record, this information was provided by NIH to then oversight ranking member James Comer nearly three years ago in October 2021. So despite the clear evidence that Dr. Fauci and his agency did not fund gain-of-function research under the P3CO regulatory definition and that the virus is studied under the federally funded grant Echo Health Alliance grant could not have been the progenitor virus for SARS-CoV-2, Republicans have levied these unsubstantiated allegations knowing very well that they are not true. And they have done so to push their extreme partisan narrative that Dr. Fauci and our nation's public health officials caused the COVID-19 pandemic. Now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Comer from Kentucky for five minutes of question. Thank you. Dr. Fauci, in your opening statement, you attempt to distance yourself from your previous senior advisor, Dr. Morenz. You say that Dr. Moran's title was just made up, that he was not an advisor to you, and that his office was in a different building. So, Dr. Fauci, did Dr. Moran's report directly to you? Um, actually, I'm not sure exactly what the on-paper report is. He is senior advisor to the director, but it is conceivable we can get that information. He might have reported through someone lower, like my but deputy. So your senior advisor did not report directly to you? There are very few people who report directly to me. Okay, Dr. Mar Dr. Moran's testified that he could walk into your office anytime he wanted to, is that true? No, that's not true. You don't just walk into the office. I mean, he's there, I mean, it's conceivable that he Did he, he ever walk into your office? I would say he did occasionally, but the idea, can, can I finish the answer to you, sir? No, because I've got a lot of questions. Okay. Dr. Fauci, did you ever delete an official record? No. Dr. Fauci, did you ever conduct official business via email? 
To the best of my recollection and knowledge, I have never uh, conducted official business via my uh, private email. So there's a troubling pattern of behavior from your inner circle, not just Dr. Moran's, but also your chief of staff, Mr. Folkers. Do you agree that it violates NAID, NAID policy to use personal email for official purposes? The, the Dr. Mor Morin's uh, issue that was discussed by this committee violates NIH policy, yes. But does using official email, using a personal email for official business, does you, that violate policy? Using a personal email for official business violates NIH policy. Does it violate NAID, uh, NAI, NA, NIAID policy to delete records to intentionally avoid FOIA? Yes. Okay. On April 28, 2020, Dr. Moran's edited an EcoHealth press release regarding the grant termination. Does that violate policy? That was inappropriate for him to be doing that for a grantee as a conflict of interest, among other things. So on March 29, 2021, Dr. Moran's edited a letter that Dr. Dasik was sending to NIH. Does that violate policy? Yes, it does. On October 25, 2021, Dr. Moran's provided Dr. Dasik with advice regarding how to mislead NIH on EcoHealth's late progress report. Does that violate policy? That was wrong and inappropriate and violated policy. On December 7, 2021, Dr. Moran's wrote to the chair of EcoHealth's board of directors to, quote, put in a word, end quote, for Dr. Dasik. Does that violate policy? Should not have done that. That was wrong. And that violates policy. Well, I'm not sure of a specific policy, but I imagine it does violate policy. He should not have been doing that. In addition to all those actions, Dr. Moran's wrote to Dr. Dasik, quote, Peter, from Tony's numerous recent comments to me, they are trying to protect you, end quote. Did you ever talk to Dr. Moran's about Dr. Dasik or EcoHealth Alliance? Um, I, was, I can tell you, regard to what you said, I never spoke about protecting him. I mean, obviously we knew that Dasik was a grantee, so I may have mentioned and discussed Dr. Dasik because he's a grantee, so but I never spoke that about up. protecting You're testifying him. that he just made that up. Excuse me? You're testifying that uh, Dr. Moran's just made that up. I don't know where he got that, but that's not true. So by this point, Dr. Fauci, when these, these emails were written, you should have known that Dr. Dasik was more than two years late on a required progress report with his grant. Uh, Dr. Dasik conducted an experiment that resulted in a novel virus showing excess growth, that Dr. Dasik failed to report that experiment, that Dr. Dasik was protecting the Wuhan lab and not sharing its lab notebooks, and that Dr. Dasik failed to, to disclose obvious conflicts of interest. So why were you trying to protect Dr. Dasik and EcoHealth Alliance? I repeat on the record, I have not tried to protect Dr. Dasik. And that's number one. Number two, you said something that's not true because I did not know about the compliance issues until well after the fact when I was being briefed for going to before a congressional committee. So it wasn't as, as these things were going on, I knew that he was withholding. Let me, did you know about Dr. Moran's close relationship with Dr. Dasik? Dr. Moran's made it clear that Dr. Dasik was his friend. I did not engage in any of that interaction between them. And, and you, just lastly, if I may, Mr. Chair, you, you testified and answered uh, the chairman's question that you never had any communication with the intelligence community throughout all of COVID. Did I understand that correctly? No, you heard wrong. I said I did have communication. I was briefed by the intelligence community multiple times during the COVID issue. And you never... The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Raskin, from Maryland for five minutes of questions. Okay. First, uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, thank you for your testimony and your extraordinary service to the American people. Let me just start. Was there anything you wanted to clear up in that last exchange that, where you were interrupted? No, I think I made it clear. I mean, they were talking about my knowing about uh, a lack of compliance. That became clear, Congressman Raskin, well after the fact. 
It isn't as if they were not complying and I was not monitoring their non-compliance. I didn't know about it until it was a done deal. Gotcha. You've been a scientist and a scientific administrator for 54 years. Is that right? More than a half century? And Correct. you were director of the National Institute of, uh, of Allergies and Infectious Diseases for more than three decades. Is that right? 38 plus years. 38 years. Okay. And I assume that uh, uh, you've never been accused of trying to uh, start a disease before. Is that right? That is correct. Um, you have devoted your life to fighting infectious diseases for the American people. Is that right? That is correct. I want to go back to um, this email that you cited in your opening because I think it goes right to the heart of this uh, campaign of character assassination against you. The claim was essentially that you tried to cover up the possibility of there having been a laboratory leak, which of course is perfectly possible and if this committee were doing its job, we could actually be working to advance the investigation of that. But they would rather assert that you tried to cover up this possibility. Um, here's the email that you sent uh, on February 1st uh, at 12.38 a.m. Um, to Christian Anderson. Um, with a copy to Christian Anderson, but you sent it to Professor Jeremy Farrar. Jeremy, I just got off the phone with Christian Anderson, and he related to me his concern about the furine site mutation in the spike protein of the currently circulating 2019 NCOV. I told him that as soon as possible, he and Eddie Holmes should get a group of evolutionary biologists together to carefully examine the data to determine if his concerns are validated. He should do this very quickly. And if everyone agrees with this concern, they should report it to the appropriate authorities. I would imagine that in the USA, this would be the FBI. And in the UK, it would be M MI5. It would be important to quickly get confirmation of the cause of his concern by experts in the field of coronaviruses and evolutionary biology. In the meantime, I will alert my US government official colleagues of my conversation with you and Christian and determine what further investigation they recommend. Let us stay in touch. Best regards, Tony. Was this the email where you were putatively trying to cover up the possibility of a lab leak? Uh, yes, uh, Congressman Raskin, and that's the reason why I mentioned in my opening statement that is it inconceivable that anyone could get out of that that I was covering anything up? Would you have any reason to cover up uh, any new scientific evidence relating to the origins of the COVID-19 virus? Absolutely not, and that's the reason why it was important to get people together that to discuss this in a transparent way. Have you spent your whole life trying to determine the causes of infectious diseases and then to stop them to protect the American people? Yes, I have. Well, Dr. Fauci, um, I want to join my colleague from Florida in apologizing to you uh, that some of our colleagues in the United States House of Representatives seem to want to drag your name through the mud uh, they're treating you, Dr. Fauci, like a convicted felon. Actually, you probably wish they were treating you like a convicted felon. They treat convicted felons with love and admiration. Some of them blindly worship convicted felons. Um, is there anything else you would like to say to the American people about your service to America during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic? My main job during the COVID pandemic was to play a role with my team at the Vaccine Research Center to develop a safe and effective vaccine. And we did that in an unprecedented short period of time, never seen before in the annals of vaccinology. As we all know, that vaccine and those vaccines have resulted in saving of hundreds of thousands of lives in the United States and millions of lives throughout the world. Well, you have fought uh, AIDS and HIV. You have fought COVID-19. Um, and you are fearless in doing so, do you have any reason to be afraid of scientific evidence or data or the truth? Not at all. So take a deep breath, because my questions change sometimes based on things that happen in the hearing. And I want you to follow the bouncing ball with me. Um, and, and there's no gotcha at the end of this. I'm just trying to figure this out. You told Dr. Ruiz in his questioning that it was absolutely impossible for any of the viruses that you all were funding, I get that, it was impossible 
for SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-2, known as COVID-19, to have come from any of the work that was being done at Wuhan. At the same time, you told Mr. Comer that you didn't know about the noncompliance by EcoHealth until after the fact and when the virus is already out there, however it got there. In light of the fact that part of that noncompliance was a report where we uncovered, and I believe that Dr. Dashak was untruthful to this committee in one of his reports to NIAD, and further, that in the two most sensitive years related to the uh, humanized mice experiments, we never got lab notebooks from Wuhan Institute of Virology. Can you understand, following the bouncing ball, why some of us doubt that, not that you had some hand in it or that you knew about it, but the doubt that you can say, state with certainty that it was impossible because they might have been doing stuff you didn't know about. Isn't that true? Um, actually, it's not incompatible at all, Congressman, with what I said. The viruses that were studied, whether you did or did not give a five-year report on time, were still the viruses that phylogenetically would be impossible to be the precursor of SARS-CoV-2. So it was completely compatible with the statement that I made to and Dr. Is that, Ruiz. Is that accurate as well, knowing that they had worked on uh, adding a furin cleavage site to uh, MERS? But, sir, there's a difference between the viruses that were funded by the NIH subaward versus anything else anybody else in China might be doing. Excellent. We but were talking about did the NIH... You were talking about what you funded. What we funded, and All right. that's the point. And, and that goes to my next question, because I thought you might go there, and I appreciate that. Right. Because in an off-the-record member-level briefing in February of 2022, I asked about the likelihood of nature of a SARS-related coronavirus to have a furin cleavage site, particularly since it takes the 12 uh, nucleotide change in there to make, it so to make it as viral as this was going on. And at the time, you said to me pretty much what you just said, and I want you to just confirm it for the record, well, that wasn't us. If that was being done, it wasn't us. Yeah. And you confirmed that for the record, yes? No, it wasn't I'm, you. It wasn't what you were funding. What I'm saying is that I cannot account, nor can anyone account, for other things that might be going on in China, which is the reason why I have always said and will say now, I keep an open mind as to what the origin is. But the one thing I know for sure is that the viruses that were funded by the NIH phylogenetically could not be the precursor of SARS-CoV-2. And I appreciate that because I've, I've never thought that, that NIH or NIAD went out to, to create this thing, but I am a believer that it came out of the lab. And I think you've just made it clear, and sometimes people miss this, Dr. Fauci. One side says one, one, side says one thing, one side says the other. And the actual fact may be that at some time working on, on that, maybe they used some of our money to get started, maybe they didn't. But a group of scientists getting together might very well at Wuhan have said, hey, let's see what happens if we go over here and do this. Not that NIH funded it, but they on their own went off and did something. Isn't that accurate? Isn't that possible? Well, I actually would also would want to say that one thing we should put out on the table that you were talking about a $120,000 a year grant in a $6 billion budget. So, I mean, if they were going to do something on the side, they have plenty of other money to do it. They wouldn't necessarily have to use a $120,000 NIH grant to do it. And, and I appreciate that because it means something could happen. I'm glad you kept an open mind. I would ask this one final thing, though. Do you think they could have done it without the humanized mice that we gave them? Yeah, could have done what, sir? Could, have done, could they have done any other research with the humanized mice that we gave them? Would they be successful? China didn't have the humanized mice before we gave them to Wuhan. Isn't it accurate that they might have been able to do extra stuff with our mice? Sorry, sir. That's a hypothetical that I can't really answer what they could but have But you could can't say have. it couldn't have happened either. I well, yield back. You want me to prove a negative? <laughs> you know, these special investigative committees are... are 
intended at the outset to bring light to difficult matters, and I think, unfortunately, this select committee has brought more heat than light to things. Uh, and one example is nearly five months ago, Dr. Fauci sat for a 14-hour voluntary interview with the subcommittee. I was there for that interview, which included exchanges on many important questions on research safety, long COVID, vaccine development, and the importance of strong public health systems in our local communities. Also, we discussed pandemic preparedness, uh, like stockpiling supplies for our hospitals uh, in advance of the next pandemic. But I want the public to know that for five months, the Republicans sat on that transcript. They could have released it at any time. It was released last Friday. If the public had seen it five months ago, they would know that they, the Republicans failed to find uh, a shred of evidence of their far-fetched conspiracy uh, linking Dr. Fauci to a cover-up of the origins of the pandemic. Instead, the Republicans contorted and mischaracterized Dr. Fauci's uh, words over Twitter uh, to gin up conspiracies about NIH's role in the origins of the pandemic. In the lead up to this hearing, parts of that interview have again been cherry picked and distorted in press releases and tweets. So Dr. Fauci, I wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to publicly clear anything up. Uh, does anything come top of mind right off the bat in, in how they cherry picked uh, parts of your 14 hour transcript? I, I don't want to be casting stones at the distortions of what was said in that, but you know, there were a couple of things that had come to mind. You know, one I'm sure is going to come up later is the issue of the six foot distance. And I made the statement that it just appeared, uh, and that got taken at like, I don't know what's going on, it just appeared. It actually came from the CDC. The CDC was responsible for those kinds of guidelines for schools. Not me. So when I said that it just appeared, it appeared. Was there any science behind it? What I meant by no science behind it is that there wasn't a controlled trial that said compare six foot with three feet with 10 feet. So there wasn't that scientific evaluation of it. What I believe the CDC used for their reason to say six feet is that studies years ago showed that when you're dealing with droplets, which at the time that the CDC made that recommendation, it was felt that the transmission was primarily through droplet, not aerosol, which is incorrect, because we know now aerosol does play a role. That's the reason why they did it. It had little to do with me, since I didn't make the recommendation, and my saying there was no science behind it means there was no clinical trial that proved that. That's just one of the things that got a little distorted in the response to that. And, and I've learned and, and watched you over the years. I, I have to go back to uh, the Zika outbreak where we didn't know uh, how exactly it was being transmitted. And, uh, and at one point, we weren't, we weren't aware that some of, the, some of it was sexually transmitted. That's an example of of why with these public health threats that you learn, you learn unfortunately if, as we uh, go along. If it's not already submitted for the record, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to offer into the record the, the Democratic staff report just completed, Republicans Fauci flop, select committee's 15 month probe fails to find evidence of extreme claims linking Dr. Fauci to COVID-19's origin. Without and objection. thank the staff, this is an outstanding report that, that folks should read, thank you. I think many of us in the committee are really disturbed by re revelations to this committee um, that there were officials at NIH that deleted government records, they deleted personal or they used personal information, personal emails to communicate and circumvent freedom of information laws. Um, so I, I just had a couple questions about that. Dr. Fauci, did you delete any emails or records related to the Wuhan lab or the origins of the virus? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, Dr. Morins said in a 2020, May 2021 email, he indicated that uh, he was connecting people to you in a, quote, secret back channel. Do you know what he was referring to? 
I don't have any idea what he's talking about. There is no back channel at NIAID. Okay, there is, uh, he also said in another email that there is no worry about Freedom of Information uh, Act. I can send stuff to Tony on his private email. Did you communicate with anyone uh, relate, relating to anything regarding NIH or with Dr. Morins on a private email? I do not do government business on my private email. Okay, so was there, so have you communicated with Dr. Morins via private email, even if it was not necessarily your definition of government business? It, it might have been because, as I mentioned in my opening statement, one of his functions is to write chapters, medical scientific chapters with me, so it is conceivable that I communicated with him on, a, on my private email when we were writing a chapter, and that was not official. What business. about Peter Daszak? No. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify for the record, because today you testified that you did not suppress the lab leak theory, yet in the past you have said, quote, it is a distortion of reality, unquote. You've said, quote, I've heard these conspiracy, conspiracy theories, and like all conspiracy theories, they're just conspiracy theories. That's what you told the American people. And so would you like to clarify what science were you following then versus yeah, now? Yeah, no, I, actually I've also been very, very clear and said multiple times that I don't think the concept of there being a lab leak is inherently a conspiracy theory. What is conspiracy is the kind of distortions of that particular subject, like it was a lab leak and I was parachuted into the CIA like Jason Bourne and told the CIA that they should really not be talking okay. about a lab leak. Thank you. That's um, the conspiracy. Appreciate that. Dr. Fauci, um, how much have you earned from royalties from pharmaceutical companies since the pandemic began in 2021? Zero. It says NIH scientists made 710 million in royalties from drug make makers. Uh, you're saying that you, you did not receive any of the $710 million. On COVID, I received, I think, $122 for, an, for a monoclonal antibody that I made 27 years ago. Okay, so just in general, though, how much have you received, not, not related to COVID, just in general, how much have you received in royalties between 2021 and 2023? I think none. Okay, so somebody received the $710 Somebody million. did, but not me. You didn't receive any royalties, okay. I, mean, I see no royalties associated with COVID. I mentioned, I, yeah, I said, you know, I, I wanna, I'm, yeah. no, I just said, I'm on the record and I wanna make sure that this is clear, that I've developed a monoclonal antibody about 25 years ago that's used as a diagnostic that has nothing to do with COVID and I receive an average of about $120 a year from that patent. Okay, but the bottom line here is that scientists at NIH uh, did receive $710 million in royalties, and I guess my question is, don't you think that if these experiments are made using American tax dollars, that any of those royalties, this nearly billions of dollars, should be going back to the American taxpayer, not in the pockets of the scientists? Do you believe that's a law that we should consider changing? Uh, if you want to change the patent laws and the, and, and, and the Bayh-Dole Act, then Go ahead, okay. <laughs> but th that's not for me to well, say. I'm asking your opinion. Okay, well anyway, um, moving on, I just wanna say that uh, you know, we know billions of dollars have been funding these animal experiments, both here domestically and in foreign uh, land. I'm very troubled by the uh, animal, the cruel, horrific animal research that has been done on US land and in foreign laboratories of taxpayers are footing the bill for billions of dollars. These beagle puppies that have their, uh, these, their throats slit, uh, they're being injected with ticks, they are murdered after uh, just a few months, um, piglets, rabbits, you name it. FDA is saying we no longer need to be uh, testing uh, human medications on animals, that there's other ways to achieve this. Um, can you comment on that, if it's time for the United States of America to be moving on from these cruel animal and horrific costly tests. I'd be happy to comment then, but I'm puzzled as to what that has to do with the origins of COVID. Well, I have a question about it. Okay, and I'd before be happy this to committee, answer. And it has to do in general with yeah. the amount of waste of tax dollars right. that NIH is using. Well, the animal experiments that are conducted by and funded by NIH go through strict uh, uh, regulations of the proper use of animals in research. So I'm not, Congressman, with all due respect, I'm not trying to be confrontative. I, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but the experiments that the NIH funded go through strict regulatory processes 
of the treatment of animals, the humane treatment of animals? Well, they're not very humane, and I will say, as the former director, you, 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 you signed off on these experiments, and so my time has expired, and we will... Well, I signed off on them because they were approved by a peer review. You know, I, I'm, instead of actually taking a serious look at the various ways by which this virus could have emerged in a lab or in nature, my Republican friend, colleagues and friends have spent the last 15 months trying to pin blame on NIH, NIAID, and specifically Dr. Fauci for the COVID-19 pandemic. And now, and just, you know, let's bring everything in. Look, I want to have a discussion about animal testing too, but I'm really not sure how that comes into here. So, but I want to be perfectly clear though, that the select subcommittee has seen no evidence of this. However, allegations by my Republican colleagues amplified in the media have led to real tangible consequences for Dr. Fauci in his personal life in a way that should be unacceptable to all Americans. Dr. Fauci, you and I have known each other for a long time and I'm not even gonna admit how long. But during that time, I've seen your commitment not just to science, but to advancing the greater good. And I know that this isn't a topic you enjoy discussing, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to ask you about it. But I think the American people need to know what we are doing to those who are serving the common good and public health. I think it's important to make clear the harms that you and your loved ones have suffered because of these deeply irresponsible accusations. Because you know what? You're human, just like the rest of us. So, Dr. Fauci, can you please share with us the nature of the threats you have received since the car start of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yes, there have been um, everything from harassments by emails, texts, letters uh, of myself, my wife, my three daughters. Uh, there have been credible death threats leading to the arrests of two individuals, and credible death threats mean someone who clearly was on their way to kill me. Um, and it's required my having uh, protective services uh, essentially all the time. Uh, it is very troublesome to me. Um, it is much more troublesome because they've involved my wife and my three daughters. At these moments, how do you feel? Keep your mic on. Terrible. Do you continue to receive threats today? Yes, I do. Every time someone gets up and says I'm responsible for the death of people throughout the world, the death threats go up. It's unacceptable that you've been treated this way, especially after you've dedicated your life to science and research for the public interest. You deserve better. Every human being deserves better. And I'm afraid that the treatment you've received will also have far-reaching consequences for the future of science, particularly when done for the public good. Dr. Fauci, how do you think the threats towards you and other public health officials have received will impact bright young scholars thinking about going off into science or public service? Think as many people want to follow in your footsteps as they did when I first met you? You know, Congressman uh, Dingell, I, I think this is a powerful disincentive for young people to want to go into public health and maybe even science and medicine in the public arena because it's very clear that not only I, because I'm, I'm a, a very much of a public figure, but many of my colleagues who are less visible than I whenever they speak up in defense of the kinds of things that we're trying to do to protect the American public, they too get threats. And when they see that their colleagues get threats, they say to themselves, I don't want to go there. Why should I get involved in that? And you have some potentially very good talent that would be important to maintain the integrity and the excellence of the public health uh, enterprise in the United States. We're not getting the best people coming in because they're reluctant to put themselves 
and their family through what they see their colleagues being put through. Well, you're right. You're not alone in feeling that way. In fact, ahead of today's hearing, the Select Subcommittee received a letter from the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, which represents public health officials in communities of all political persuasions, detailing the surge of harassment, intimidation, hate speech, threats of violence, and death threats that their members faced during the pandemic. Can I just, I'm gonna ask to insert the, into the letter, but I wanted to just make the point before I close, Mr. Chairman, that as many as 40% of public health work workers have been bullied, threatened, or harassed. And I think we all need to take that on as a public health issue. I'd ask to enter the letter into the record and yield back. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize Ms. Lesko from Arizona for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Fauci, did the National Institute of Health fund the potentially dangerous enhanced potential pandemic pathogens gain of function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? I would not characterize it the way you did. The National Institutes of Health, through a subaward to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, funded research on the surveillance of and the possibility of, of emerging infections. I would not characterize it as dangerous gain of function research. I've already testified to that effect a couple so, of times. So you're saying no, correct? Um, in, in his May 16th, I'm 20 saying no because I've said no multiple times, including on the transcribed interview. In his May 16th, 2024 testimony, the NIH Deputy Director Tabak said, and I quote, I can tell you that the failure of the Wuhan Institute of Virology to provide us with the data that we requested and the lab notebooks that we requested certainly impeded our ability to understand what was really going on with the experiments that we have been discussing this morning. My question to you, Dr. Fauci, if the NIH didn't inspect the Wuhan Institute of Virology and NIH didn't receive the lab books and data from China and the required reports from EcoHealth Alliance were not submitted, in fact, they were late, how can you definitively say that the NIH did not fund the dangerous gain-of-function research? I go back to what I said that the gain of function research by the operative and regulatory definition of P3CO does not include at all the viruses that were studied under the sub How do you know that, sir, if there was be no lab books, nothing we, from China? We know what viruses they were studying. How? How do you know? You never went there. By the, by you, I'm telling you that the NIH funded research on these viruses. If someone else somewhere in China, was doing something else. Well, that and that's not, the problem, because that, NIH didn't go there. You didn't get the reports that were needed. How in the world would you know? I'm going to go on to the next well, question. Well, and you're not hearing what Doc, I'm saying. Dr. Morenz, your senior advisor for over 20 years, said in an email dated February 24, 2021, I learned from your FOIA lady here now how to make emails disappeared when I am FOIA'd. But before the search starts, so I think we are all safe. Plus, I deleted most of these earlier emails after sending them to Gmail. In another email dated 42121, Dr. Moran said, I forgot to say, there is no worry about FOIAs. I can either send stuff to Tony, meaning you, on his private email or hand it to him at work or at his house. He is too smart to let colleagues send him stuff that could cause trouble. Dr. Fauci, were you ever engaged in attempts to obstruct the Freedom of Information Act and the release of public documents? No. Did, you, did Dr. Morenz communicate with you about official business using his private email? Official business? No. Did you ever encourage Dr. Morenz to use his private email address for official business? No. My next question, sir is on February 1st, 2020, uh, you, yourself, Dr. Fauci, the NIH Director Collins, and at least 11 other scientists were on a conference call to discuss the origins of COVID. 
A number of the scientists said that they were concerned that COVID was the result of a lab leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and were, and were concerned that a revelation of the lab leak theory would hurt their relationship with China. The CDC director Redfield testified that he was not invited on this conference call and he believes that because he believed the lab leak theory was possible. Three days later, on February 4th, 2020, four participants on the conference call authored a paper, Proximal Origin, which was sent to you for editing. Proximal Origin pushed the natural origin theory. On April 16th, 2020, the NIH director, Dr. Collins, emailed you expressing dismay that the Nature Medicine article, which was based on Proximal Origin, didn't suppress the lab leak theory and asked you for more public pressure to suppress the lab leak theory. The very next day, in response to Dr. Collins' request to suppress the lab leak theory, you cited the Nature Medicine article, which discounted the lab leak theory from the White House podium. My question to you, sir, did you cite this article at the White House because the NIH direct director asked you to suppress the lab leak theory? I did not do that in response to anybody's suggestion to suppress anything. It was in response to a question that someone asked at the podium. And I did not edit any paper as shown in my uh, official testimony. So you said about four or five things, Congressman, that were just not true. Well, we have emails to prove it. Well, you don't. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And by the way, no, we don't have it. So I get tired of hearing we've got it, and then when we ask for it, it's not there. We do not have it, Dr. Fauci, and for everyone watching this. That's just incorrect. Now, let me just say a couple of things. If I sound a little outraged, it's because, you know, we sit here and we watch one conspiracy theory after another get debunked. And if I might, on a point of personal privilege, to the gentlewoman from New York who wanted to argue that we should be worrying about testing of human medicines on animals. Um, I'm going to go down a list of mitigation measures that you supported over the course of the pandemic and ask you just to give a yes or no as to whether you still believe these measures were justified. Business closures? not hearing you at all. Could you please speak louder? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I'm going to go through a list of COVID mitigation measures that you supported over the course of the pandemic and ask you to give me a yes or no as to whether you believe these measures were justified. Business closures? Early on when 5,000 people were dying a day, yes. Church closures? Same thing. School closures? Again. The Stay at home orders? These were important when we were trying to stop the tsunami of deaths that were occurring early on. Er, How early long on. you kept them going is debatable. Mass mandates for adults, mass mandates for children, mass mandates for children under five. And going back to what I said before, all of that is in the context of at the time, four mass to five thousand people Mass mandates for children under five, scientific evidence for that? Excuse me? Mass mandates for children under five, there's scientific evidence supporting that? There was no study that did masks on kids before. You couldn't do the study. You had to respond right. to an epidemic that was killing four to 5,000 Americans per Vaccine day. mandates for employees, vaccine mandates for students, vaccine mandates for military. Vaccines save lives. It is very, very clear that vaccines have saved hundreds of thousands of Americans and millions of I'm not debating. We're talking about worldwide. the COVID-19. Uh, did or do the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccine, stop anyone from getting COVID? I answered that question to the chairman. Early on, it became clear that... They did. No, actually, no. In the beginning, it clearly prevented infection in a certain percentage of people, but the durability of its ability to prevent infection was not long. It was measured in months. And they didn't stop you from spreading it either. Early right. on, it did if it prevented infection, but what became clear that it did not prevent transmission 
when the ability to prevent infection I, wanes. I, I think what's troubling is when the American people look at the um, certainty and the, the case at which people lost jobs, they lost livelihoods. I had rural hospitals in my, in my area that did not have a single case of COVID in their rural community that had to shut down and people not get care that they did need uh, for cancer, and, and some passed away because of those kind of things. Uh, and and uh, time after time again, people's lives are destroyed, and we have not seen the same sort of once the new data came available, we did not see a change of course. And you'll point out, for example, in the schools that the CDC, you know, put out the guidelines, for example. But, uh, but we know that those guidelines end up being protection from lawsuits. It's if you don't want to be sued, you better follow the guidelines. So they're not mandates, de facto mandates, but they turn out to be such a mandate. Um, and, and when the science began to change, began to, we all understand that in the first couple of weeks, first few weeks, even a couple months, we were all trying to figure it out. I think there's a lot of grace for that. The concern is that as the science became available, there wasn't like a, oh, maybe we should consider the lab leak theory. Oh, maybe we should consider um, natural immunity. We never heard these messaging coming from you or from anyone else who stood on the sidelines talking about these things. And it's left the American people with a, a, a tremendous distrust. I want to talk a little bit about the grant process. My understanding from your testimony to us, it says that the NIH process for awarding grants is that basically research proposal goes to peer review committee to receive a priority score. Then it goes to an advisory council for NIH personnel. It receives a final, basically the group votes on it, and then eventually it ends up on your desk for signature, right? Now, you said in that that sometimes, if I recall correctly, is those grants are often approved in block, in mass, when they're voted on, and then you sign off on them. That's correct. I, I, this, this is one of the things that's really troubling to the American people because w they look at their lives being destroyed, and there's no one to hold accountable because these systems are of of accountability have become systems of plausible deniability. And so your name is on every single grant, but yet you you absolve yourself of any sort of responsibility by saying, well, you know, it goes to this committee that's, you know, uh, that has a number of people on it and they're approved in block, and so there's no accountability for anything, any of the taxpayer dollars that are going forth. I disagree with you, Congressman, because if you look at the number of grants, we fund thousands of grants it would be physically impossible for me to go through every single grant in a detailed way to understand it. That is true not only for me, but for virtually every institute at the NIH. Then why does your signature go on it? Because somebody has to sign off on it, and you trust the expertise and the competence of the staff that go over then what it what is the mechanism for holding The gentleman's time has expired. But as I understand it, perhaps the strongest measure of COVID-19 vaccines effectiveness is the reduction of severe disease and death, not necessarily getting a milder form of COVID. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, it's very clear that when you're dealing with many vaccines, but particularly when you're looking at COVID, the, as I mentioned, and I'll repeat it quickly for you, that early on there was a degree, not as much as against severe disease, of protection against infection. Unfortunately, that protection against infection, which is related to transmissibility, mm -hmm. waned rather rapidly in a matter of months. What has stood firm well, much better than transmission and much better than infection, is the ability to prevent someone from hospitalizations and deaths. And in fact, the curves, Congresswoman, are stunning. When you look at the deaths and hospitalizations of people who are unvaccinated, it's like this. When you look at the deaths and hospitalizations for people who are vaccinated and boosted, it's like this. The difference is profound. When you're dealing with infection, again, less so because of the waning of protection against infection. Well, and that was also confirmed by a Commonwealth Fund December 2022 um, report that um, 
which came out two years after the Biden administration's effort to get COVID-19 vaccines in arms, and your effort too, that it prevented more than 3 million deaths and averted 18 million hospitalizations. And that came out in 2002, but it seems to con corroborate what you're saying. Indeed, and $1.15 trillion in healthcare costs. Thank you for that ad. Um, one pillar of the vaccine requirements was, um, was to have an increased uptake in the, in the COVID-19 vaccines. And that, that at the time was supported by leading physicians, um, including the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and more. Were the vaccine requirements a clinically sound tool for improving uptake of a safe and effective vaccine? Yes, you would like people to get vaccinated voluntarily and realizing the important effect on it. But the fact that people were vaccinated by whatever their motivation was clearly saved many, many lives. And just with the 17 seconds I have, um, what steps can public health officials take to bolster confidence in these life-saving interventions since there has been so much misinformation circulating? That's going to be very difficult, Congresswoman, because there is so much mis- and disinformation around that we've got to do a better job of reaching out and trying to get the correct information. But that's difficult when you have a very energetic group of people continually spreading mis- and disinformation about vaccines. We've got to be more proactive in putting out the facts and the data and the information that's correct. Dr. Fauci, one of the controversial regulations of the pandemic was the six-foot distancing rule. This rule became an important policy consideration in subsequent regulations. However, you testified recently, and I'm quoting, this six-foot rule sort of just appeared. Do you think that a role that sort of just appeared is substantial justification for the regulations that we saw based on that six-foot role? Congressman, thank you for that question. I, I answered that, but I'll summarize it briefly for you. When saying it just appeared, it came from the CDC. Okay, you stated that earlier. What was your relationship with the CDC when you saw a regulation which was not based in the current science? Well, when I say was not based in science, I meant a pro prospective clinical trial to determine whether six foot was better than three, was better than 10. But once we realized what? that the virus was not spread by droplets and was aerosolized, right. did you feel an indication to go back to the CDC and said, let's base this on science. Let's get rid of this six foot rule. This six foot rule crippled right. businesses. It allowed students to stay at home and not learn. Americans suffered. And that suffering continues because the fracture of trust in American scientists continues to this day. Did you not feel an obligation for something that just sort of appeared? Not to go back to the CDC and say, let's base this on what we know? It was a CDC decision and it was clear. Were you dialoguing with the CDC? Excuse me? Were you in communication with the CDC? CDC was part of the coronavirus response team. Yeah. And you didn't feel an obligation to go to them and say, look, Americans aren't going to trust us. Yeah. We're providing them with misinformation. We have discussions at the White House about that. We did. But the CDC's decision and was their decision to make, and they made it. And you didn't feel an obligation as the lead scientist at the NIH to challenge that? I've challenged the CDC multiple times. Publicly on this issues. regard? Excuse me? Publicly you challenged them on the six-foot uh, distance it, rule? It is not appropriate to be publicly challenging a sister organization. Do you agree that Americans now have lost their trust in science, in lead science from government because of misinformation like this? Well, I, you know, when you talk about misinformation, I think that you have to be careful. It, it's not disinformation. It was information that ultimately proved when you put the aerosolization in that, that it was not an effective role to have six right. feet of distancing. Dr. Fauci, let's move on. On April 21st, Dr. Morins wrote to Dr. Daszak in an email that there is no worry about FOIAs. I can either send stuff to Tony on his private Gmail, hand it to him at work, or at his house. 
He is too smart to let colleagues send him stuff that could cause trouble. Do you realize that this impact still considers today? Do you, this is your lead, trusted researcher who works with you, your advisor. Do you realize the impact of that? It was a terrible thing. It was wrong, and it was inappropriate. Thank you. I think, we, said I think we all agree it was incredibly inappropriate. Recently, in an op-ed that Senator Roger Marshall published just yesterday, he raised concern about HHS FOIA compliance following your testimony in front of the Senate Help Committee. Dr. Fauci, what involvement did you have in HHS not responding to FOIA requests following your testimony in the Senate in 2021? I had no role whatsoever in anything to do with the request. When FOIA is made, it doesn't go directly to a person like me. It goes to a department which then takes care of it. So I don't have any role one way or the other in FOIA. Let's go on. Were you aware that NIAD employees conducting official work on unofficial emails and inappropriately assisting grantees during your time as a director? I was not aware of that as it was occurring. It obviously came out during the, commission, the, the committee hearings, but I was not aware of that. As and I think that occurring. you put an exclamation point on how important these hearings are. Dr. Fauci, would you agree that this demonstrates the need for more accountability and increased oversight of NIAD? What you saw, I believe, with Dr. Morins was an aberrancy and an outlier. The individuals at the NIH and NIAID are of a very committed group of individuals, and this one instance that you point out is an aberrancy and an outlier. That does From not your senior advisor for 20 years. Well, he is, well, the title is senior advisor. We wrote scientific papers together. He didn't advise me, as I mentioned. Are your senior advisors not trusted staff? Again, I told you that his title was senior advisor, but he is not an advisor on policy. He That's writes very confusing science. to have someone's title right. and not having that to be their obligation. But that work. is the fact, though. I think that that supports what we said. There needs to be more oversight and there needs to be more accountability. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but these points are very clear to all of us today in this hearing room. I yield back. Mr. Fauci, you were quoted on CBS Face the Nation saying it's easy to criticize, but they're really criticizing science because I represent science. Do you represent science, Mr. Fauci? I am a scientist who uses the scientific method to gain information. Yes, and you said you represent science. Do you represent science, Mr. Fauci? Yes again, or no? It, yes or no? No, that's not a yes or no answer. Yes, it's a yes or no. I don't think it is. Okay, well, we'll take that as a you don't know what you represent. Oh, I... But this, as director of the NIH, you did sign off on these so-called scientific experiments. And as a dog lover, I want to tell you this is disgusting and evil, what you signed off on, and these experiments that happened to beagles paid for by the American taxpayer. And I want you to know Americans don't pay their taxes for animals to be tortured like this. So the type of science that you are representing, Mr. Fauci, is abhorrent, and it needs to stop. Mr. Fauci, you also represent the type of science that you, where you confess that you made up the COVID rules, including I didn't hear what you six said. feet social distancing and masking of children. I never just, said I made anything up. You admitted that you made it up. You made it up as you went. I didn't say I made it up. So are you saying this is fake news, Mr. I Fauci? I didn't say I made anything up. What did you say? I said that it is not based in science and it just appeared. But this is science. What does dogs have to do with anything that we're talking these about are, today? These are scientific experiments. This is what you signed off on. But you also told the American people they had to distance by six feet. They had to wear masks. But let's also talk a little bit further about the type of science that you represent. NIH scientists made $710 million in royalties from drug, drug makers, a fact that's been hidden. Let's talk about the fact about is it right for scientists and doctors getting paid by the American people, government taxpayer paychecks to get patents, where they're paid millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in royalty fees, especially 
when the NIH and these government agencies, most powerful agencies in our country, are recommending medical uh, suggestions and advice and making up guidelines like six feet distancing and masking of children. Do you think that's appropriate? Do the American people deserve to be abused like that, Mr. Fauci? Because you're not doctor. You're Mr. Fauci in my few minutes. No, I don't need your answer. I want to talk about this right here. Mr. Mr. Chair, Fauci, objection. I reclaim Mr. my Chair, time. Objection. I reclaim my time. I reclaim my time, Gentilated Mr. Raskin. Gentle lady will suspend. Order. Mr. Chairman, of order. Just in terms of the rules of decorum, are we allowed to deny that a doctor is a doctor just because we don't want him to be a doctor? Yes, because in my time, that man does not deserve to have a license. As a matter of fact, it should be revoked, and he belongs in Gentilated prison. Don't suspend. And the gentlelady should recognize the doctor as a doctor. Thank you, Mr. Can Chairman. Is this what we have become? Is this what we have devolved into? No I'll, decorum. You know what? We can do that hearing about the poor men that were injected with syphilis because I support you in that. That's horrific. And this government that I does things like that to Ms. Americans doesn't have decorum to the American Mr. people. Chairman, the gentleman is out of order. Point of regular order, please. The gentleman is out of order. Decorum. I recognize the point of order. Go ahead with your point of order. You got it. No, I mean, I, I, I was going to say what, what Representative Raskin said. That's completely unacceptable to be able to, to deny Dr. Fauci, uh, who's here a respected member of the, of the medical community, his title. And that's actually a personal attack on, on his character. And I have instructed her. He's not respected. And I have instructed her to address him as a doctor. General I'm not addressing him continue. as doctor. Let's talk about, I would, let's talk about Chairman, this. I, I'm I reclaiming my time. I'm reclaiming my time. Words get taken I'm down I'm reclaiming then. my time. Second that. Point of order. Suspend. All right. A member can only move to have words. I'm sorry. The issues we are debating are important ones that members feel deeply about. And while vigorous disagreement is part of the legislative process, as I said at the beginning, members are reminded that we must adhere to established standards of decorum in debate. This is a reminder that it is a violation of House rules and the rules of this committee to engage in personalities regarding other members or to question the motives of a colleague. Remarks of that type are not permitted by the rules and are not in keeping with the best traditions of our committee. The chair will enforce these rules of decorum at all times and urges all members to be mindful of their remarks. Does the gentleman from California have anything further? Well, she should take her, we should have to take her words down. Yeah, I made it. I, I right. offered that her words be taken down, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a point of order. Mr. Griffin they is accused us Mr. of Griffin worshiping is, President, lady, President Trump. We don't lady, worship President Trump. Gentle lady, we'll Trump. Gentle lady, we'll Gentle Trump. lady will suspend. Mr. Griffin, you have a point of order. Mr. Chairman, while it may not be uh, polite, I believe the rule only applies to uh, members of this body, the Senate, and um, the President of the United States, I do not apply, believe that it applies. The rule on taking down words does not apply to a witness. Again, I'm not condoning the words. I'm just uh, relating uh, or asking whether or not it applies to individuals who are just, just happen to be here in front of us. I agree. The chair overrules the point of order by the gentleman from Maryland, but ask that members please afford all other members the respect they're entitled Refrain from using rhetoric that could be construed as an attack on the motives or character of another member or the witness. You may proceed. Thank you. This was a time in history where you got to throw out the first pitch at the Washington Nationals baseball game while Americans were forced to stay home and watch such events that they love from at home alone on their televisions. And what a hypocrisy this picture shows. Here you are, without your mask, with empty seats everywhere. Remember the cardboard cutout fans? That was one of the most insulting things to Americans, having to watch the games from home, where you got to go and enjoy the game, and sit right next to people, not following the six feet of distancing, not wearing your mask, and everyone else was forced to stay home and stop enjoying life. And your science here, your science is displayed perfectly in this picture, where children, 
children in school were put in plastic bubbles because of your science, your repulsive, evil science. And let's go back to your very own email. You said earlier you don't use email. Oh, you do, right here. This is your own email where you said the typical mask you buy in the drugstore is not really effective in keeping out virus. I do not recommend that you wear a mask. This is your email, this is your own words. But yet children, children all over America were forced to wear masks, healthy children forced to wear masks muzzled in their schools. And then they were forced to learn from home because of your so-called science and your medical suggestions while you and all your cronies get paid from Big Pharma. You know that what this committee should be doing? We should be recommending you to be prosecuted. We should be writing a criminal referral because you should be prosecuted for crimes against humanity. You belong in prison, Dr. Fauci. Mr. Chairman, I have another point of order. I recognize Ms. Dingell. I just want to make sure the record is clear. Dr. Fauci testified that he did not use his personal email for official business. He did not say he did not use email. And I think today this particular has been full of lies and disregard and disrespect, and we need to stick to facts. Oh, thank you. Uh, you're not allowed to oh, You're speak. not thank allowed. You. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Chairman, could you ever remove from yes, the... Uh, thank thank you. Yes, thank you. Please. Excuse me, I asked the Capitol Police to escort. Yep, thank you, she can be removed. Yeah, you can be removed, actually you're not allowed to speak. Your time has Take expired. your Starbucks with you. Mr. Garcia, Mr. Raskin, you're out of thank line. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your times have expired. Dr. Fauci, I have to say, I, as so many Americans, am deeply disappointed in your actions during a critical time in our nation's history while you were in key leadership roles as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and as the Chief Medical Advisor to President Biden. Put quite simply, you failed miserably in my opinion. Based on all we have learned during the pandemic and all that we have since learned through this committee's work, I believe your failures stem from both an effort of self-preservation manifested by a series of lies and cover-up and by a total failure of leadership. It was obvious to everyone that you and your organization, NIH, had a lot to lose if the American people were to discover that COVID-19 was most likely leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China, and that you via EcoHealth Alliance and Peter Daszak actually funded this research, and that this lab was actively and recklessly conducting gain-of-function research. As such, you did everything in your power to deflect and cover up this possibility. You even recruited others to help you in this effort. Unfortunately, this cost our country and the world valuable time, time that may have led to answers regarding the origin, may have blunted the spread, and would have almost certainly saved lives. While I think most of us have known all along what I just described, what I have been appalled to discover through sworn testimony to this committee is the level at which you and those that worked for you went to cover up the obvious. Just a few examples, and I know these have been touched on, but they're important for everyone to hear. Dr. Lawrence Tabak, former acting director of NIH, testified that under the generic definition that NIH did in fact fund gain-of-function research. This was based on a definition that was initially used by NIH and a definition that was abandoned and removed from the website in October of 2021 and replaced by a new, much more detailed definition with a much higher bar that you have since conveniently used to define gain-of-function testing and to deny what Dr. Tabak has since confirmed. He also said that EcoHealth Alliance failed to properly and promptly report that their research violated the terms of the grant, something that went completely unaddressed under your watch. Dr. Morans, your senior advisor, who you have tried today to distance yourself from, but whose large volume of emails clearly demonstrate that you had a very close and personal relationship with, and who reported to you directly, has openly bragged about he, how he subverted FOIA requests. I remind you that the law requires you and your former organization to comply with Freedom of Information Act requests. It is not optional. If you or your employees or your organization that you oversaw were, syst were systemically uh, avoiding transparency and illegally hiding or destroying documents that rightfully belong to the American people, then you should be criminally charged and they should as well. In addition, 
Dr. Gregory Folkers, your chief of staff, also engaged in illegal practices in which he crafted messages using symbols instead of letters to avoid FOIA exposure. In an email, April 2020, from Dr. Morans to Peter Daszak, he says, quote, There are things I can't say. Well, I wonder what he couldn't say. He also went on to say, quote, Except Tony is aware, and I have learned there are ongoing efforts within NIH to steer through this with minimal damage to you, Peter, and colleagues, and to NIH and NAID, end quote. And then a few days later, he said, quote, I have reason to believe that there are already efforts going on to protect you, end quote. In February of 2021, Dr. Morans wrote to uh, Boston University scientist Gerald Kirsch saying, quote, I learned from our FOIA lady here how to make emails disappear after I'm FOIA'd, but before the search starts. So I think we are all safe, end quote. Dr. Fauci, I want to know what you were being protected from and what you needed to be safe from. I'm going to go on because I have a little time here. He went on to say, quote, plus I deleted most of the earlier emails after sending to Gmail. Once again, illegal and an actual crime. Dr. Morans noted in another email to Dr. Kirsch saying, quote, I learned the tricks of the uh, I learned the tricks last year from an old friend, Marge Moore, who heads our FOIA office and also hates FOIAs, end quote. It is absolutely amazing to me that Dr. Morans and Marge Moore still have jobs and our taxpayers are still paying their salaries. Dr. Morans wrote to Dr. Daszak in April of 2021, quote, P.S. I forgot to say there is no worry about FOIAs. I can either send stuff to Tony on his private email or hand it to him to work or at his house. He is too smart to let colleagues send him stuff that could cause trouble. Appar end quote. Apparently, you neglected to surround yourself with equally smart individuals. Dr. Morans wrote to another collaborator, Peter Hotitz, in June 2021, at Baylor College of Medicine, that he had deleted all his emails related to COVID origin when, quote, the shit hit the fan, end quote. He said, quote, I feel pretty sure Tony were too. The best way to avoid FOIA hassles is to delete all emails when you learn the subject is pretty sensitive. In October 2021, Dr. Morans wrote to Peter Daszak, quote, Peter, from Tony's numerous recent comments to me and from what Francis has been vocal about over the past five years, we are trying to protect you. And, and they are protecting their own reputations as well, end quote. I'll just jump ahead. The, the American people can rest assured that we are going to continue to pursue answers and we continue to push for full accountability from you and your colleagues despite continuing efforts to try to cover this up. Dr. Fauci, history will not be kind to you and you will be known as the man who put his personal interest before the interest of the American people, the very people that you were supposed to be protecting. Your actions, along with several others we have had before this committee, have completely eroded America's trust in our public health system and the agency that you represented for half a century. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired and now recognize Mr. Kuda from Hawaii for five minutes of questions. Dr. Fauci, what percentage of the population did we estimate needed to be infected with COVID before we would achieve so-called herd immunity? Herd immunity was very elusive with COVID and the Great Barrington Declaration was flawed both conceptually and in practice. Conceptually, that you could shield vulnerable people as if the only vulnerable people are those in nursing homes. We have tens and tens of millions of vulnerable people that you couldn't possibly shield. People with underlying conditions, the elderly, those would be the individuals. So it would be conceptually impossible to do that. Herd immunity, as we know, means if you have a virus that doesn't change and a virus in which when you get infected or vaccinated, you have highly durable, perhaps lifelong immunity. That's not the case with COVID. We know immunity wanes and we have multiple variants. So in practical purposes, the Great Barrington Declaration was invalid, both conceptually and practically. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. You've asked, answered a few of my other questions in terms of the fact that for many of us that live in multi-generational communities, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions more lives would have been impacted by this so-called approach. Uh, and given the fact that the virus is rapid evolution that we have since seen since 2020, uh, herd immunity approaches would be absolutely ineffective against COVID. Um, if you would answer one more question, considering the mortality rates at the time, how many more deaths might we have seen, just briefly? I mean, if we had done that, just let it rip, there very likely would have been another million people would have died, I would imagine. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. It's been insinuated that politicians, only politicians, only bloggers, only conspiracy theorists are disagreeing with you. I want to point out that I'm probably the only member of Congress that actually treated 
patients during the pandemic from the very beginning to the very end of the pandemic during night shifts in the ER. Thousands of patients during that time. And uh, in 2020, I was censored. My medical license was threatened because I disagreed with bureaucrats. Literally taken off the internet as a person who is treating patients with leading edge technologies, developing theories, but doing my very best, but being censored by the United States government for the first time stepping in and taking the place of medical professionals as the experts in healthcare. Any dissent surrounding COVID-19 treatments, mass mandates, and any public policy surrounding the pandemic was immediately labeled as anti-science. I watched as public health officials and politicians told my patients what treatment options were best for them, regardless of their comorbidities or their medical history. Despite my education and my training and my experience, my opinions were relegated to conspiracy and misinformation by so-called healthcare experts who had never treated a patient throughout the entire pandemic. This has been a black eye on the medicine and has highlighted why government should never, never insert itself in between patients and their healthcare providers. The American people deserve to make medical decisions through conversations with their physicians rather than politically motivated mandates. Dr. Fauci, did you ever treat a patient for COVID during the pandemic? I was part of a team that was at the NIH that took care. We didn't take care of many of them. Okay, so COVID. not hands-on. Got it. Thank you. Why would I be criticized by a bureaucrat for doing my very best as a healthcare? This is a rhetorical question. But why? Why would the government, who has never treated a patient for COVID, you can read all the things you want, but you're not there. You're not seeing patients. You're not watching people die, intubating patients right there with that disease in your face, watching it happen, watching the development of this disease and actually learning from it. But I'm being told by bureaucrats what's right and wrong. And what's funny is everything I was censored on, I was proven to be right. Pretty crazy, isn't it? You said in an interview that you gave as part of an audio book written by Michael Spector uh, that you believed an institutional should make it hard for people to, to live their lives so they'd feel pressured to get vaccinated. Could we re, re, uh, run the audio clip on that, please? You think can be done about it. I have to say that I don't see a big solution other than some sort of mandatory vaccination. I know federal officials don't like to use that term. Once people feel empowered and protected legally, you are going to have schools, universities, and colleges are going to say, you want to come to this college, buddy? You're going to get vaccinated. Lady, you're going to get vaccinated. Yeah. Big corporations like Amazon and Facebook and, and, and all of those others are going to say, you want to work for us? You get vaccinated. And it's been proven that when you make it difficult for people in their lives, they lose their ideological bullshit and they get vaccinated. Thank you. Are all objections to COVID vaccinations ideological bullshit, Dr. Fauci? No, they're not, and Thank that's you. not what I was referring to. Well, in reference to making it hard for people to get education, traveling, working, I'd say it very much was in context. And I take great offense to this. Miss Allison Williams testified before this committee about losing her job because she sought an exemption for ESPN's vaccine mandate, which came from recommendation from bureaucrats like yourself. She and her husband were actively working with a fertility expert, a physician, on how to get pregnant and agreed with the premise that she was young, healthy, wanted to get pregnant and shouldn't get the vaccination for medical purposes. But she was fired because you made it hard, just like you said in your statement, because you didn't want to make sure that the ideological bullshit got in the way of her working, of living her life, of making a medical decision with her healthcare professional. I think America should take great offense to this. That's exactly what you meant when you said making it hard for people to live without getting a vaccination. You affected people's ability to work, travel, be educated, to actually flourish in American society, to self-determine as we're all given God-given rights. Shame on you. Dr. Fauci, you've become Dr. Fear. Americans do not hate science. I don't hate science. The American people hate having their freedoms taken from them. You inspired and created fear through mass mandates, school closures, vaccine mandates, 
that have destroyed the American people's trust in our public health institutions. This fear you created will continue to have ripple effects over generations to come. You have already seen its effects in education, in the economy, and everything else. Quite frankly, you said, if you, agree, if you disagree with me, you disagree with science. Dr. Fauci, I disagree with you because I disagree with fear. And with that, I yield. Um, I was not here, uh, but I saw a member of this committee questioned whether or not you represent science and tried to make that in some offensive way. I just want you to know most Americans don't think she represents Congress. So, so one of the things I've learned. So, so uh, I hear now you double, double Fauci. Um, so I don't want you to, to, to be offended, uh, offended by that. Uh, I actually, similar to uh, Representative McCormick, who was serving in the field as a doctor during COVID, I was running the logistics operation and the Florida response as the director of emergency management for the state of Florida for Governor DeSantis. So I was deploying masks and gowns and gloves. We were setting up field hospitals. We were setting up testing sites. We were setting up vaccine sites uh, throughout, uh, throughout the pandemic. And the one thing that became clear to me as a country is we were not prepared. In fact, we actually had many preparations for a pandemic. But both the states collectively and the federal government threw that out and kind of was just um, uh, making it up a as we go. One of the things I wanted to ask you, and I understand you're not in the response uh, field, but do you feel since you've left that we are better prepared today than we were uh, several years ago when COVID hit? In some respects, <clears throat> excuse me, in some respects we are but in others, I'm still disappointed. Um, and, and I think one of the things that was really a, a, a problem with the response was the degree of divisiveness that we had in the country about a lack of a coherent response where we were having people, for reasons that had nothing to do with public health or science, refusing to adhere to public health intervention measures. What I think that we will do better, hopefully, is that the CDC, I believe, has now recognized some of the failings of the lack of communication and, and interaction between the federal response and the local public health officials. One of the weaknesses that we had in the United States that other countries didn't have was a disconnect between the healthcare system and the public health system, whereas the CDC can't demand information from local public health individuals. They have to volunteer to give it to them, and it isn't given to them in real time. So we were at a disadvantage. Oh, no question. I saw that. I saw how the, the lack of investment in technology, right? We had states trying to share information with the federal government using, you know, Windows 2000. Or well, fax machines. Fax machines. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So... Um, yeah. And so, you know, we spent $7 trillion in two packages in two administrations. And one of my concerns is, is that I feel that, especially in supply chain, I feel like we, we're not that much better off than we were before COVID. Am I wrong in that assessment? Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't think you're wrong, but I, I hope that the CDC has made it very clear that they are trying to change that and correct that deficit of a separation between the local and the federal CDC so that we can get information in real time. It was very frustrating for us that often we had to go to the UK or South Africa or Israel to get real time information because they had a connection between what was going on in the ground and their public health system. So they right. knew right away what was happening. We didn't. Dr. Fauci, you talked about how, you know, we live in partisan times, a lot of misinformation uh, and, you know, colleagues on, on this body said, you know, you should be, you know, charged and, and found guilty. Of course, the only one that's, that's happened to is your former boss. Uh, but, you know, the, the question I have is, when you saw a lot of that disinformation, whether it was, you know, we can use a disinfectant to do like a cleaning or do light in the body, or that, you know, China's working super hard, President Xi's got it contained, all of the stuff that was being put out, were you concerned you know, what, what was your feeling at that time 
uh, working in the administration, seeing that come from the podium? Well, I was very frustrated by that. It was very clear. I was put in a very difficult position that I didn't like of having to contradict publicly the President of the United States. I took no great pleasure in that, but I felt it was my responsibility to preserve... He must have thought you did a great job. He gave you a commendation right before right. he left. <laughs> well, I felt it was my responsibility, you know, as to preserve my own personal integrity and my major responsibility to the American public to tell them the truth. And if I could just take this opportunity, when I was saying that if you attack me, you attack science, I didn't mean that I am science. What I meant was that when the data show that hydroxychloroquine does not work, and there are people saying, oh, it does, I'll give it to people, and we know it can be hurtful to them, then when you're attacking what I'm saying, that the science shows it doesn't work, and the science shows that bleach doesn't work, that when you attack that, you really are attacking science, because science has shown that it doesn't work. That's what I meant when you're attacking me, you're attacking science. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Now recognize Mr. Jordan from Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doctor, why was it so important that the virus not have started in a lab? Uh, we don't know where it started, and that's the reason why I keep an open mind. So I don't know what you mean by why was it so important. It wasn't important. Well, you, it was you, important. Still don't know where, you still don't know where it started? The guys you gave money to figured it out in three days. No, no, no. They Mr. Anderson said on January 31st, 2020, uh, virus looks engineered, virus not consistent with evolutionary theory. The very next day, Dr. Gary said, I don't know how this happens in nature. It'd be easy to do in a lab. And then three days later, Shazam, they switch and say it, didn't, it has to be nature. So they figured out in three days, but you still don't know? <clears throat> no, in fact, if you look at what they were saying, Congressman Jordan, they were saying that it was not a manufactured virus. It still could have re evolved out of a lab. Well, let me read something here to you. In our, They're in our, not incompatible. In our study on the censorship of the Biden administration working with big tech, I want to read you a uh, WhatsApp message from Mark Zuckerberg. Can we include that the White House put pressure on us to censor the lab leak theory? So this is a communication on July 16th, 2021. Nick Clegg, Joel Kaplan, Sheryl Sandberg, Mark Zuckerberg. They're certainly feeling the pressure to downplay any lab leak theory and go with the natural origin theory. Is there a question there? There's coming. There's one's coming. Here's another email to Mark Zuckerberg. It says, subject line, COVID misinformation, Wuhan lab leak theory. In response to continued public pressure and tense conversations with the new administration, we started removing five COVID claims, including the lab leak theory. Mr. Zuckerberg responds, this seems like a good reminder that when we compromise our standards due to pressure from an administration in either direction, we often later regret it. Why was it so important the virus not have started in a lab? It wasn't so important that the virus not. We don't know. We well, know it was important to someone in the Biden administration, so much so that the top people at Meta, the top people at Facebook are asking, why are we getting all this pressure to, to, to downplay the lab leak theory? And we have an email from June of the same year, June 4th, 2021, saying the same thing. It was certainly important to somebody. Well, what has that got to do with me? I'm asking you because you're the expert on the coronavirus. I'm saying why was the administration why was the administration so pushing not to have the lab leak theory as something that was viable? I can answer that I've kept an open mind throughout the entire process. You kept process. an open mind, Dr. Fauci, open mind. That is um, correct. What happened in those three days? Why did Dr. Anderson and uh, or excuse me, Mr. Anderson and Dr. Gary, why did they change their mind in 180 degrees? Because what, what Christian Anderson says three days later, after he said virus looks engineered, virus not consistent with evolutionary theory, three days later he says the main crackpot theories going around at the moment relate to this vi virus being somehow engineered, and that is demonstrably false. How did, they, how did they figure all that out in three days, Dr. Fauci? You can you, do you that. You still have an open mind. Well, what they did is that, that you know, they, they testified before this committee what they did. They went back and looked at the sequences and realized that their initial concern was unfounded about that, and it did not look at all like it was manufactured. But as they said in their paper, even though they feel it was more likely... Three days, they figured that's it out. That's exactly. You could do okay. that in three days. You okay. can scan sequences in a day. You okay. don't need three days. Okay, uh, who's Robert Redfield? The former director of the CDC. Dr. Redfield, right? And he, was, uh, and he was also on the Coronavirus Task Force. Is that accurate? 
he was a member of the coronavirus task force. And here's yeah. what he said to this committee. He said, Redfield said that Fauci and Collins left him out because Redfield suspected that coronavirus had leaked from the Chinese lab. Is that accurate? Well, he said that, but that's not true. You're that saying, is incorrect, Congressman. Dr. Redfield's lying to the committee no. when he sat right where you sat? When he said that I kept him out, that is an incorrect statement. The, 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 the roster who was, was on was, the phone was... Dr. Was, Redfield in that conference call on February 1st when you had Mr. Anderson and Dr. Gary on that call? He was not. And the conference call was put together by Jeremy Farrar. So no one kept him out. He said he was kept out because... Did he US, felt, did U.S. tax dollars... You want me to answer the question? Yeah, I, I would just wonder why he wasn't on the call. It seems to me the head of CDC, part of the coronavirus task force, which was formed two days prior to that call, would have been on the call. Well, the call was arranged by Jeremy Farrar. You should ask him. Okay. Uh, did U.S. tax dollars flow through a grant recipient to the lab in China? I'm sorry. What was did U.S. tax dollars flow through a grant recipient to the lab in China? Yes, of course. It was a sub-award to the Wuhan Institute. And who approved that award? Excuse me? And who approved that award? What agency approved that award? National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Your, your agency approved that, right? Yes, it did. After Does that have anything to do with this downplaying of the lab leak theory? No. Nothing to do with it? Nothing. What, do, you, do you agree that there was a push to downplay the lab leak theory? Not on my part. Really? Really? Wow. wow. I, think, I think most of the country would find that, find that amazing. I still got 11 seconds. We got well, look at the facts. I've kept an open mind throughout the entire process. All right, I yield back. I now recognize the majority staff for no longer than 30 minutes of questions. Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci, it's good to see you again. I want to ask a couple questions about um, some of the members' questions and then get into some follow-ups. Um, the issue of the uh, CIA trip was brought up. That was brought to us by a whistleblower. That was not an allegation made by the committee. It was an allegation made by the whistleblower. Um, you testified at a transcribed interview back in early January. Do you recall me asking you about that allegation? About the going to the CIA? Yes. yes. Um, and do you recall, and you denied it then as well, and you denied it here today. Uh, do you recall the subcommittee publishing that you denied it? I, I don't recall. Uh, we did. We did, okay. We put it out in a press release afterwards okay. that you denied the whistleblower's right. allegation. Um, and then today, during the course of the last couple hours, have any members on the majority side of the dais asked you about a trip to the CIA? Yeah. You've been asked a number of times about uh, your former uh, senior advisor, Dr. Morins, um, and have said, and I, I want to make sure I characterize it correctly because I, it goes a little back and forth, um, that you didn't conduct official business over a, over a personal email with Dr. Morins. Has Dr. Morins emailed your personal email before on non-official purposes? As I mentioned, we wrote scientific papers together, so he very well may have okay. used that. Of course, that's the email I use when I write a scientific paper. Right. And that's because NIAID policy allows you to write on semi-official time write papers, but you just have to put a disclaimer that this is yeah. not the view no, In other words, if, if you're doing something as official business, you shouldn't use your emails that are your official business. So in order to be compliant with the regulations, you would use a personal email. I appreciate it. Um, I want to ask about some of the public health policies enacted during the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Francis Collins, the former NIH director, recently said in an interview, and I'm quoting, uh, you attach an infinite value to stopping the disease and saving a life. You attach a zero value to whether this actually totally disrupts people's lives, ruins the economy, and has kept many kids out of school in a way that they never quite recovered. Um, understanding the COVID task force had a lot of voices at the table, is that an accurate description of the public health advisors? And then you could fit in other advisors along yeah. the way? Yeah, uh, you know, Mitch, what, what I believe that Dr. Collins was saying was that we give a advice based on pure public health issues. It's very, very clear now, retrospectively, looking at the potential collateral negative effects of things like mandating, it would be important for us now, since the purpose of, I believe, why we're here, is to how we can do better next time. 
is to consider the balance. I think things that we did in the beginning were in the context of horrible situation of four to 5,000 deaths per day. But that doesn't mean that you don't go back and look and say, did everything we do at that point and the duration for which we did it, was that appropriate and do we need to re-examine? I believe that's what Dr. Collins was referring to, and, and I agree with him on that. And you got to my next question that we are here trying to figure out how to do better next time, lose yes. fewer lives next time. Um, would that be a better thought process going forward of thinking about the possible unintended consequences of public health measures? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you've heard from both sides of the dais today, first weeks, months, novel virus, <laughs> nobody knew what was going on, called for some drastic measures. Um, understanding, or I, once there was a better understanding of who the most affected demographics were, um, do you think it would be important to more narrowly tra uh, craft public health measures to specifically favor those demographics? The, the answer is yes, but you have to be careful. Because if you have a, a certain group that is being predominantly aff afflicted, if you're really, really clear that another group is really quite protected, then you should fashion it demographically related. But what often happens with outbreaks is that they're a moving target, and you only hear about other vulnerables as you get further into the outbreak. So the answer to your question is you're partially correct that you need to do that, but you've got to be careful when you're dealing with a moving target. And uh, we can appreciate that. In, you've been asked a little bit again about the theories of natural immunity and herd immunity. Those are both real scientific theories in infectious disease. Is that correct? Yes. And between uh, a, a fe infection acquired immunity and vaccinated acquired immunity, did the United States hit herd immunity? The answer is no, uh, and I've written a paper on that, is that when you're dealing, and just let me take 30 seconds, I don't want to run out the clock on you, <laughs> but I think it's important to, to make this point. When you talk about herd immunity, it's predicated on two principles, that you're dealing with a pathogen that's not changing, and number two, that when you either get infected or vaccinated, the duration of the immunity is measured in decades, if not a lifetime. So that if you have a pathogen that stays the same, like measles, doesn't change. So I was infected with measles, measles when I was a child. It's the same measles that's infecting people in certain countries in the developing world. Number two, when you get either infected or vaccinated with measles, you have immunity that's durable minimally in decades and possibly for life. So if you get the same pathogen and you get a large percentage of the people who have either been infected or vaccinated, then you have herd immunity. We did not ever have that with COVID. Um, and you've also been asked a number of times about the vaccine and vaccine mandates. Uh, were you the one that recommended to the president to mandate vaccines for certain individuals? No. Do you know who did? No, it was, it was more of a, uh, it was a combination of, of a group and just saying that, you know, certain agencies like the Labor Department or what have you would feel that this would be done. But it was not like I one day said, hey, we should mandate vaccines. That did not happen. Um, and I want to echo the comments of the chairman that we agree the vaccine saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in January, and I think you touched on it a little bit today. Could issuing these mandates and removing the notion of informed consent from some certain sects of the citizenry lead to vaccine hesitancy? Yeah, I, I mentioned this, in, in, I believe, in, in the TI, mm -hmm. that as a matter of fact, that's something that I think we need to go back now when we do an, an after the event evaluation about whether or not given the psyche of the country and the pushback that you get from those types of things. We need to reevaluate the cost benefit ratio of those types of things. Um, and then I won't belabor the point, but we talked about the six foot distance an awful lot today. Um, do you recall if it was ever suggested to be 10 feet? 
You know, I don't recall, Mitch, if it was ever suggested it was 10 feet, but I, when I made my explanation of what it was, I was saying that there was no trial that looked at 10 versus 6 versus 3 versus not even worrying about it at all. Um, and you said today that there were discussions at the White House about the six-foot rule. You don't recall if it was discussions about whether or not it should be three or should be 10 or should you be know, six? You I, know, I, I don't recall, Mitch, what the exact discussion was, but as I've said in response to multiple questions, what we had, it was it came, the CDC was said that on, on the basis of their evaluation, which was based on the droplet approach, that six foot would be to go. And since there was no clinical trials going one way or the other, that's why it was accepted by the group. Um, and then it hasn't been a large topic today, and we talked about kind of, again, the, the many unknowns in early 2020. Schools were closed through the semester. Some schools reopened in the, in the, for the fall semester. Some remained closed going through into 2021. Um, looking back, uh, were there, are there current academic ramifications of remote schooling or kids not being in school? I think there have been a number of, not I think, I know, <laughs> that there have been a number of studies to show that there are lasting effects, at least up to this point. I, you know, they tend to attenuate over time, but there have been substantial negative effects on learning and on children when you keep them out of school for a prolonged period of time. Have, have you seen any studies suggesting physical health ramifications? I haven't seen physical health ramifications. Mental, have, he mental it, health? Uh, I believe that there are some that show psychological issues that relate to keeping kids out of the environment, of the social environment of the school. Um, I'm, and I apologize for bouncing around. We don't have 14 hours with you today. I've got 30 minutes, so I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry about that. I'm going to move quickly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Again, across the dais, both sides of the aisle, a lot of questions on the origins of COVID and finding out the origins and um, how that could better lead to both protecting against spillover and wildlife uh, trade, but also increased biosafety standards. Um, as you sit here today, is it possible that COVID-19 was the result of a laboratory-related accident? Oh, absolutely. And I keep, like I mentioned multiple times, I keep an open mind. I feel, based on the data that I have seen, that the more likely not definitive, but the more likely explanation is a natural spillover from an animal reservoir. But since there has not been definitive proof one way or the other, we have to keep an open mind that it could be either. And um, based on that answer, I think, is the hypothesis that COVID-19 accidentally leaked from a lab a conspiracy theory? No, I mentioned that several times. Conceptually, the concept of it is not a conspiracy theory. Um, We've talked a little bit about the proximal origin of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the paper authored by Dr. Anderson. Uh, it came to two primary conclusions, and I'm quoting, our analysis clearly show that SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct or a purposefully manipulated virus, and we do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. Um, do you disagree with those conclusions? I think, Mitch, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the paper in front of me, I think they also said the possibility of if you passaged it, and you could have done that. And, they, and, they, that, and if you passage it, it's in a lab. <laughs> so it is, I mean, that could be. And they, they dispelled that at the end with the, we do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. Um, so I'm just, I ask again, is a laboratory-based scenario plausible? Well, I mean, again, I'm not, I, I don't want to speak for what they meant in that paper, but I have said multiple times, I keep an open mind that it could be either a laboratory leak or it could be what I think the data is leaning towards mostly, which is a natural occurrence from an animal reservoir. And this email was brought up too on April 16th, 2020. Dr. Collins wrote to you and said, wondering if there's something NIH can do to help put down this very de destructive conspiracy referencing the lab leak. I hope the Nature Medicine article on the genomic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 would settle this, but probably didn't get much visibility. Anything more we can do? The next day, you were at a White House press conference and cited proximal origin and said uh, that proximal origin established that COVID-19, quote, is totally consistent with a jump of a species right. from an animal to human. Um, 
Did anyone tell you to cite proximal origin from the White House podium? No, it was in response, I believe, to a question that might have been asked by a reporter, but I wasn't s stimulated to say that at okay. all. I was responding to a question. At that time, back in April of 2020, um, was it also your belief that a lab leak was possible? Yeah, I've always had an open mind about it. And then I want to correct the record again a little bit on um, the drafting and publication of the Proximal Origin paper. Did Dr. Anderson send you drafts to review? He sent drafts, but I'm going to jump ahead of you, if I might, dribble around. I did not edit it. That was, it was mentioned by a few of the, it was. the congressmen. I did not edit the paper. I, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to get on the yeah. record. Right. Um, I want to talk about Dr. Morens and what you wrote in your opening testimony and some of the answers that you gave today. And just for clarity, you were, uh, in addition to being unaware of his use of personal email and potentially intentionally deleting federal records, were you also unaware of his actions to assist Dr. Daszak and EcoHealth? I, I, am, I was aware of his friendship. I was not aware of his attempts to assist him to respond to an NIH inquiry. So not aware of the editing of press releases or editing of letters? No, I was not. On November 11th, 2021, Dr. Morenz wrote in an email to Dr. Daszak that he attempted to discuss the EcoHealth grant with you and you, quote, got upset and told him to have no more communications uh, with Peter. Why did you tell Dr. Morenz to no longer communicate with Dr. Daszak? Because I think it's inappropriate to do what he did. I mean, and your committee has called him out very definitively about that, and it was inappropriate to do that. This is back in 2021. Right. What did you know about what he was doing then? I didn't know exactly what he was doing, but I don't think it's inappropriate for people to be communicating and helping a grantee in a response. I didn't know exactly what he was doing, but I didn't think it was appropriate. Um, when did you, you testified to uh, Chairman Griffith, or uh, excuse me, Chairman Comer, um, that you knew about the compliance issues later on with right. EcoHealth. When did you first become aware? I became aware during briefings by my staff in preparation for congressional hearings, well after the fact where the compliance issues actually happened. That, I mean, I didn't know, as I mentioned to you in the TI pitch, I didn't even know the grant existed before the outbreak. And then finally, when there was this issue about congressional hearings, I needed to know what is this grant, what are we doing with it, and are there any issues? That's when they said there was a compliance problem of the fourth year versus the fifth year uh, progress report. Um, some of the other emails from Dr. Morenz, I just want to read into the record and ask you if his recollection is accurate. On April 27th, 2020, Dr. Morenz wrote, I am sure privately he would love to see Peter and EcoHealth fully restored, although he did once make the comment to me that Peter had screwed himself with the late report. I already told him that all that crap wasn't true. The late report was true, despite what Dr. Morenz said. On April 21st, 2021, Dr. Morenz wrote that he was sure you would do anything you could to restore the funds to EcoHealth. On June 5th, 2021, Dr. Morenz wrote that you were working behind the scenes to undo the damage to EcoHealth. On October 21st, 2021, Dr. Morenz wrote, Peter, I had my regular meeting with Tony this morning. He immediately inquired about you and several times asked how you were doing. He used a lot of colorful language about the situation with attacks on EcoHealth. On October 25th, 2021, Dr. Morenz wrote that you were trying to protect EcoHealth. On March 22nd, 2021, Dr. Morenz wrote, the most important is within NIH to get the decision reversed and the grant refunded. I believe Tony would like to do this. And on February 24th, 2022, Dr. Morenz wrote, it will be a small consolation to hear the following, but in my face-to-face -face meeting with Tony this morning, he once again brought up, as he usually does, your plight, Peter. Did you ever have any discussions with Dr. Morenz about protecting EcoHealth or helping restore funding? Not at all. I don't know what, I, to be honest with you, Mitch, I just don't know what Dr. Morenz is talking about with that. Maybe he's trying to, as he said, cheer up. He said that in front of this mm -hmm. committee cheer up Dr. Dasik, but to say that I'm getting involved in trying to help him or protect him, not so. Did you ever have any conversations with Dr. Morenz about what 
Dr. Daszak was facing or about the termination of the grant? You know, I may, he may have mentioned to me something like Dr. Daszak is going through a terrible times, uh, but I don't recall. It is conceivable that he would have mentioned that to me because, as he mentioned to you, that Dr. Daszak and he are very good friends. So it would not be surprising if sometime he had mentioned to me, boy, Dr. Daszak's going through some really tough times. Fine, that doesn't mean that I say no. you should help him. No, absolutely doesn't. So I, that's why we want to ask the questions and yes. get, get, get the answers. Um, during your transcript interview with us, uh, you were asked about whether or not Dr. Daszak had a conflict of interest in reviewing the origins of COVID-19. And you testified, you know, I hesitate to speculate about someone else should, what someone else should do. The only people that I am involved with is my own staff, who we've mentioned many times in this discussion, who don't have a conflict of interest. With the benefit of hindsight and the work of this committee, do you believe Dr. Morenz had a conflict of interest regarding EcoHealth? Well, from what we know now, he definitely had a conflict because he was communicating with a grantee of helping him in response to an NIH issue, which is a conflict of interest. I did not know that at the time when I made your statement. And I appreciate that. That's yeah. Um, sticking with EcoHealth, in April 2020, NIH terminated and then subsequently reinstated and then suspended the EcoHealth grant that had the Wuhan Institute as a sub-grantee. Do you recall that decision? Yes. Were you involved at all in that decision? No. Uh, you previously testified to House Energy and Commerce that you were, in essence, told to cancel the grant. Do you recall who told you? Um, we got it from a, a number of... Now, retrospectively, we found out how it was. It was the White House told the department to tell the NIH to cancel the grant. Um, did you agree with the cancellation? What is that? Do we need to listen to that? Okay. He, 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 was, he, he, he was escorted out. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm sorry. Repeat the question, Mitch. Did you agree with the cancellation? You know, I, I, it wasn't a question of agreeing or disagreeing. It was like, can we really do that? <laughs> I don't think that you can do that. And as it turned out, I was right. <laughs> because the general counsel of HHS said, by the way, you can't do that. You've got to restore the grant. And that's why they restored it and then suspended it pending the yes, compliance review. Exactly. Um, not to keep reading Dr. Morenz's emails, but on June 24th, 2020, Dr. Morenz wrote an email he, referencing you, made some additional comments to the effect that this came from the White House and he was totally opposed to it. You weren't totally opposed to it? It's, well, see, that's his, you know, he's doing a lot of interpretation, Mitch. His interpretation, I was totally opposed to it. It was more of, can we really legally do that? And the answer turned out, I was right. No, you can't. Um, do you recall, the? did the department ask you first or Dr. Collins first to terminate? I think it went directly to Building 10, uh, excuse me, Building 1, the, the director's is, office. Is that the NIH director's yeah, office? Yeah, I think it, w it went from the department to NIH to us. Okay. Um, were you, prior to your retirement in December of 2022, were you involved in any of the compliance actions NIH took against EcoHealth? I don't believe so. I think the, the actual, and, and again, I'm, I'm a little unclear about the time, but I think most of the disciplinary actions actually occurred after I left, if I'm not mistaken. The, yes, the actual suspension and debarment occurred after you left, but there were a number of letters requesting lab notebooks or further information yeah, while I, you were yeah. still there. Uh, what happened, Mitch, and it's important to point this out, once it was clear that there was compliance issues while I was still there. We were told at NIAID, stay out of it. Compliance is gonna be handled by building one, i.e. the NIH director and Mike Lauer. So the compliance was said, don't touch it, don't go near it, just we'll take care of it. And you just brought this up since the original termination, then suspension. NIH found numerous major violations of grant policies, has since debarred the Wuhan Institute of Virology and suspended and proposed for debarment both EcoHealth as an institution and Dr. Daszak individually. Are you aware of those? Yes, I am. Um, during previous TIs and hearings, when asked if they supported every one of these actions and supported the suspension and debarment, 
uh, both Dr. Collins and Dr. Tabak said yes. Sitting here today, do you support the suspension and debarment of EcoHealth? Yes. I want to move on to the kind of like known unknowns of COVID origins to quote Dr. Lipkin's paper from early 2020. Um, on October 20th, 2021, Dr. Tabak sent a letter to uh, then ranking member Mr. Comer that said the bat coronaviruses studied under the EcoHealth Alliance grant could not have been the source of SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic. You've testified similarly both back in January and today. Um, some of the things that uh, I believe Chairman Griffith brought up was just kind of that statement results on some things, rests on some things that we just can't know. Um, in your experience, Dr. Fauci, do researchers uh, publish every virus that they sequence? No, I mean, uh, I think researchers don't always publish every single thing they do. Um, do they routinely publish every experiment that they conduct? Uh, I'm sure there are people who don't publish every single experiment that they do. And then is there a lag time between the sampling, the analysis, and the publication? Yeah, I mean, publications often take months before they come out. Is it possible, if not plausible, that EcoHealth and the Wuhan Institute of Virology have samples from between 2020 when they originally published a paper, or excuse me, 2015 when they originally published a paper with all of their samples and now that are unpublished? Sure, it's possible, but Mitch, I'm, I'm, I might just throw in there, you can't get away from the fact that the viruses that were studied, that we that the NIH gave them a grant to study. Don't pull back on the fact that no matter what you did with those viruses, they were phylogenetically so different, they could not possibly be the precursor of SARS-CoV-2. And, and I agree with that. I guess my only point is that you don't know all the viruses they were working with. Yeah, and let's make that clear because uh, Griffith, uh, Congressman Griffith asked it, and I answered you quite honestly that none of us can know everything that's going on in China or in Wuhan or what have you. And that's the reason why I say today, and I've said at the TI, I keep an open mind as to what the origin is. Um, the last thing, last topic I wanna to touch on is gain of function. We touched on it in January. You touched on it a little bit today. I know. Um, the pandemic has resulted, as I'm sure you're aware, with a rather large debate, and including with the NSABB updating their uh, dangerous research policies surrounding gain-of-function P3CO and dual-use research of concern. Um, at the prior to October of 2021, the NIH website listed gain-of-function as a type of research that modifies a biological agent so that it confers new or enhanced activity to that agent. And the P3CO framework the U that the U.S. government uses to further regulate a sub a subpart of that research that is more dangerous, specifically that could cause widespread and uncontrolled death or disease in humans. Um, putting aside what's what's regulatory, I agree with you. The P3CO definition is regulatory. Are there types of research that could fall under the broad definition, but not the P3CO definition? Well, I believe members on the minority side have mentioned that. Uh, influenza is a gain of function to a virus to make it grow better in eggs. Making an E. coli manufacture insulin is telling the E. coli to do something it wasn't able to do before by mutations. Of course that's the case. Um, so in kind of the Venn diagram of this research, something could fall under gain of function without falling under further regulation. I know where you're going and you're not going to get there, but go ahead. <laughs> um, according to EcoHealth's year five progress report, they facilitated an experiment in Wuhan that had seven mice infected with Wuhan Institute of Virology 1 as the backbone, five survived. Then eight mice were infected with a chimera of WIV1 and the spike from another virus and two survived. In EcoHealth's own words, these results suggest that the pathogenicity of that full-length chimera is higher than others. Right. Um, you were asked today, and 
uh, it was read back to you a little bit, but on May 16th, uh, just a few weeks ago, Ms. Lesko asked Dr. Tabak, did NIH fund gain of function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology through EcoHealth? And Dr. Tabak answered, if you're speaking about the generic term, yes, we did. Right. On May 11th, you were asked a similar question, and you answered the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain of function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, I'm going to ask it, and you can answer it how you, how, how you want to answer it. According to the broad definition of gain-of-function research and the definition Dr. Tabak was testifying pursuant to, uh, did NIAD fund gain-of-function research via EcoHealth in Wuhan? The broad, the broad definition of gain-of-function, in my mind, is not applicable here and does nothing but confuse the situation. And that is the reason why after three years of deliberation by the bodies, including the NSABB, as well as the National Academies, it was decided to make an operative and regulatory definition. If you hearken back to the original broad definition, it does nothing but confuse people. And that's the why every time I have mentioned gain of function at the Senate hearing with Senator Paul and the TI, and today, the definition that I use is not my personal definition. It's a codified regulatory and operative definition made by a body that has nothing to do with me. Okay. We've covered just about everything, but if you come up with uh, something you want to ask me, I'd, I'd be happy to try to fill it in. But I think we've been rather, rather extensive today. I think that's great, and I think we agree. And so with that, we'll yield back the remainder of our time. And over the past four years, you have been personally targeted by extreme narratives about the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic and the U.S. government's response to it. They began in force in retaliation to wisdom you offered that contradicted the reckless uh, and dangerous uh, therapeutic recommendations by President Trump and have remained part of House Republicans' political playbook. These extreme narratives have been the bedrock of the select subcommittee's Republican-led probe and the untenable inferences they've somehow drawn despite the overwhelming evidence that it is inconvenient to those narratives. I want to be clear, the evidence uncovered from more than 425,000 pages of documents and 20 closed-door interviews of current and former federal officials has undermined the extreme narratives behind Republicans' own probe. As I alluded to at the beginning of this hearing, my Democratic colleagues and I are committed to speaking objectively and truthfully about what the evidence shows, and this is what it shows. Dr. Fauci did not fund research through the Echo Health Alliance grant that caused the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Fauci did not lie about gain of function research in Wuhan, China. Dr. Fauci did not orchestrate a campaign to suppress the lab leak theory. These findings are apparent from the evidence. In fact, this much was clear by the time of Dr. Fauci's two-day transcribed interview this past January. In the five months since, the select subcommittee has conducted several more closed-door interviews and reviewed several thousand more pages of documents. The, this additional evidence in Dr. Fauci's testimony today has only made Republicans' claims less plausible and more preposterous. And when I was named ranking member of the Select Subcommittee, I made a commitment to follow the facts in objectively analyzing the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Select Subcommittee is to meaningfully improve our nation's preparedness for future pandemics, then we must take an objective approach to the factual and scientific evidence available to us. The origins of the COVID-19 pandemic remain uncertain. I would like to remind my Republican colleagues that that uncertainty is not an opportunity for them to author fiction for partisan gain. It could have been a lab leak and it could have been an animal transmission. And at the cost of meaningfully advancing our understanding of COVID-19's origins, Republicans have levied extreme allegations of creating SARS-CoV-2 against Dr. Fauci. The result is that Republicans' own probe has failed to shed any additional light on a central question for our select subcommittee. In fact, we're actually entering the fourth quarter of this Congress and this select subcommittee on Corona's pandemic, 
And what have we focused on? It's not an objective uh, investigation on the origi origin as either lab leak or animal transmission. We have spent the vast majority of time, like in this hearing, with Republicans trying to prove that Dr. Fauci and Collins funded research through Echo Health that created the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And in order for that to be true, it is dependent on proving the lab leak theory to be true. So it has not been an objective investigation as to whether or not the virus came from a lab or, or an animal transmission in order to prevent and prepare for the next pandemic. It has been to push this narrative. And this hearing is their climax, their star witness to finally prove their narrative. And they did not do so. Instead of focusing on solutions like fortifying our public health workforce and infrastructure, securing domestic supply chain of vital public health equipment and medications, or equipping schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, businesses to safely stay open during the next deadly novel viral pandemic. Instead, they focused on accusations without evidence. And it seemed like even though the evidence was there that the accusations were false, it didn't matter. They still accused him on a cover-up, suppressing the truth, that he initiated, prompted, or edited the Proximal Origins paper, that he funded a gain of research that created the SARS-CoV-2 virus, even that he received royalties. You know, his answers today and his transcribed interviews and his countless emails refuted all of this. They always have. And his testimony today did again. But that, I guess that doesn't matter for the majority. The truth is that there is no evidence to prove this narrative that we spent so much time addressing. Their accusations are without evidence. But it doesn't matter to them. Intentionally misleading the public is propagating disinformation, and it's wrong and dangerous not only because it manufactures distrust in our public health leaders and our public health agencies, but also because it targets Dr. Fauci and other public health officials for violent death threats. Dr. Fauci just said that anytime anybody alludes to the false accusation that he created the COVID-19 pandemic, his death threats go up. But irresponsibly and recklessly, members on this subcommittee continued to accuse him of that. So for the remaining months of the select subcommittee, I reaffirm my commitment to take a serious, balanced look at the question and the possibilities of whether the novel coronavirus emerged from a lab or from nature. And I emphasize to my colleagues that any uncertainty about those origins is an opportunity for us to work constructively together on forward-looking measures to improve our nation's readiness for future public health threats. It was an opportunity to learn about our COVID-19 response and how we can improve and do better. And uh, we did some good things during that. And I'll, I'll cite Operation Warp Speed as, as one of them. It's also an opportunity to more closely examine the office in which you served because there seem to be some significant wrongdoings that took place. And I believe that we can make changes and prevent that from happening in the future. That's my goal. It's an opportunity to take a close look about the processes and the procedures in place in our health institutions in the United States. That's our job as oversight in Congress. That's what we're supposed to do. I don't know what playbook some are talking about, because it's my, been my goal as chairman, and I think you've seen the staff behave in the same way, to take a hard look at the facts so that we can do better in the future. 
I know that at the end of the transcribed interview, not only during the interview, we talked about other types of vaccines we may be able to create, mucosal vaccines, uh, maybe inhibitors of furin, if there's a furin cleavage site as part of the vaccine. I appreciated that conversation so very much. And at the end, you thanked me for, your, for the fairness. And we had the opportunity to, to share a lot that day. I think what I'm most concerned about as we go forward as a country and from our agencies is that we can be trusted and that we are better in our messaging and talk about clarity. Dr. McCormick today talked about what it was like actually treating COVID patients day in and day out. I had recommended early on that America needed to hear more from doctors that were treating COVID patients, what they were seeing, what was working, what was not working. I compared it to General Schwarzkopf uh, during the Gulf War. Everyone tuned in every night to hear what General Schwarzkopf had to say. Not the politician, but what the general in charge had to say. And I think that was important. The one who was in the trenches. But look, you know, we, we've gone back and forth on the definition of gain of function. I think it's been pretty clear what was, uh, you said was on your mind. And there's, there were two different definitions, if you will, a generic definition and an operative regulatory definition. But so, you know, when we go through this, what America hears is that you say NIH did not fund, and Dr. Tabak said NIH did fund, clarity matters. I think it would have helped when you were in front of uh, uh, Dr. Or Paul, Dr. Paul in the Senate, if you were clear about what you meant. The American people had never heard of gain of function until this came about. Clarity matters. You know, when we, we conducted great trials on the vaccines, I thought they were phenomenal. Normally you have eight to 10,000 people. Uh, we had about 40,000 people in each one of the trials. And what we knew from the trials is that one, it saved a lot of lives. That's one thing. But we also knew that if you got vaccinated, you could still get COVID. We didn't make that clear to the American people in my mind. And that, and that you could still get sick. And so if someone stands up, not you, but if someone stands up and says, if you get vaccinated, you're never gonna go to the ICU and you're not gonna die. Well, that was still happening. So where was the messaging? I wish you would have corrected that right then and there. You know, uh, president says, oh, maybe we just inject bleach. Well, some people maybe thought that was, that was serious. We made it clear it was not. And that was important. But here we have Operation Warp Speech, which I know firsthand you were working on, and you were kind enough to work with the Doctors Caucus to explain what was going on with Operation Warp Speed. And we have a presidential candidate who says, well, if that's developed, I'm not taking it. And I'm paraphrasing. And then takes it. The American public deserve a lot better from their government. And what should have been a 9-11 moment for this country, this pandemic, was turned into a political nightmare. We need to do better. These are agnostic issues, not political. And I think from the, what we have learned from you and the TI and, and, and here today, there's a lot of things that we can do better. And the, and the grant process being one of them. I mean, if you, look, when I, when I sign a prescription, I'm responsible for it. Somebody needs to be responsible. And if you're signing for grants, but not responsible for it, you just sign it, then you're not responsible for the dollars that are going out. And, and then maybe it's the advisory committee that needs to be signing the grant so that there's some level of responsibility and responsibility for compliance. I think that's one of the biggest lessons learned uh, through all this. We can do better. America's a great country. We can fix our problems. But we have to take a good hard look at what we did, what we didn't do, be honest with ourselves, be better in our messaging to the American people, especially when it comes to health. And that's why I felt it was very important that we don't do things like mandates, but let patients have a conversation 
with the doctor that they know and trust and make sure that we're getting the doctors all the information and data that they need. From adverse effects of the vaccine, which we've always done, adverse effects of the vaccine, to what the vaccine can and can't do, whether you're at risk or not at risk, what are your risks? Those are personal conversations that need to take place. And I, and I look forward to trying to establish a system that does a better job at that. 